Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is 12 o'clock, so we will get started as we have a full agenda ahead of ourselves with a social prescribing webinar this afternoon. Um, there will be a few minutes until we get too far in, so if you're still just getting settled, that's totally fine. So I wanted to start and introduce myself. So my name is Kate Muffin, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I also wanted to let you know, Rachel Shin is here today and will be supporting with the technology behind the scenes. You should be able to find her in the chat if you see tech support with a star. Um, if you have any, mess any issues throughout the webinar today, please send us a message and we'll help get you sorted. Um, it's with gratitude that I am joining you today from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I would like to invite all of you to take a moment and reflect on the territories from which you're joining us today, as I know there is great variety across the province from where each of you are joining. I wanted to start and just ground ourselves with who we are. So Health Quality BC provides system-wide leadership to efforts designed to improve the quality of healthcare in British Columbia. And the Institute for Health Systems Transformation Sustainability gathers, develops, and shares evidence about BC's healthcare system to inform decisions, among other things. Together, we form the Type 2 Diabetes Network, which is focused on sharing, developing, and applying innovative practices to improve outcomes for people living with type 2 diabetes across BC. So today, we're focusing on social prescribing and type 2 diabetes. Over the next hour, we will explore social prescribing, which involves referring or linking patients to a wide range of non-clinical services that may address unmet needs that are impacting both health and wellness. And at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for your questions so that we can discuss how this might apply to your practice before wrapping things up with a few resources and an evaluation. I did wanna let you all know if you didn't see the notification when you joined today that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website following the webinar. So we kindly ask that you refrain from identifying patients, team members, or offering any other private information when asking questions or participating in polls um, that you would not like to be shared in that manner. Access to the webinar recording, presentation slides, and any resources will be posted shortly after the webinar, typically approximately one week. So middle of next week on the type 2 diabetes webpage. Um, everyone who's registered will receive an email when those are ready. Um, and if you want to receive updates about upcoming events, including webinars like today's, um, sign up for our newsletter. I did want to take a moment and share how we'll be answering and collecting questions today. So please use Slido. We'll be putting a link in the chat for you in just a moment, but there's a few different ways that you can access that. So if you go to slido.com and enter the code T2DN, October 17th, that will get you connected. Or as I go to this next slide, here's a QR code. So if you're using a cell phone or if you have a cell phone on your desk, feel free to hold it up and scan this and that'll get you connected into Slido. We encourage you to add questions at any point during the presentation. That gives everyone a chance to take a look at them, upvote them, and then we'll answer the questions that are resonating with most of you. Um, and so here's a little bit more details of what you can expect in, to know by the end of today's webinar. So you'll be able to define social prescribing, discuss how people living with type 2 diabetes can benefit from social prescribing, and use social prescribing for people living with type 2 diabetes in your practice or local settings. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Grace Park to begin her presentation and introduce herself. Grace, please take it away. Thanks, Kate. Just gonna get my slides set. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you, thanks for joining. And I'm really happy to talk to you a little bit about social prescribing, which is work that I've been doing, and then see how we can tie it in with the topic of diabetes prevention and remission. So these were the learning objectives that was just seen. So my journey in social prescribing began many years ago. I had the privilege of doing a study tour in New Zealand. And in one community, I learned that in the Maori uh, population, they had a high prevalence of type 2 diabetes. And there was some difficulty in trying to get the help, the right kind of help in the prevention and management and remission of type diabetes by the healthcare providers. And we learned about an innovative scheme that they developed, the health ambassador in this one community. And they had uh, somebody from the community, somebody like a village elder who was respected, accompany the person with diabetes to their healthcare provider, their family doctor, 
to talk about, you know, what might be beneficial for the individual in preventing or managing their diabetes. And then the health ambassador would accompany the patient to the local farm, to the market, and actually get the right kinds of groceries and food and go over the kinds of diet that would be beneficial and would accompany them to the pharmacies to pick up prescriptions if there are any and to help to um, manage their medication as well. And so I tucked this away in the back of my head because this was like 2012 or something and we, I had not heard of social prescribing at all, but I just thought what a fabulous way to leverage the community and the relationships in the community to help individual to live a healthier life. So more recently I've been working with older adults and I just got to advance my slide. And there is definite social vulnerability in our older adults because they have increased prevalence of chronic diseases. They're living with multiple comorbidities and they're also often facing functional decline as they develop some frailty. They may have some social uh, issues like financial limitations, limited transportations, and many of them rely heavily on the healthcare system. So here I think is a prompt for me to um, introduce Kate to inch with, the, with the first poll question. So what percentage of our health is due to social determinants of health? Choose a single answer. If you could go ahead and answer. Yeah, we'll close this one up relatively quickly. So maybe another five seconds to get your answers in and then we'll share the results. So that's closed up now, Grace, those results are up on the screen for you. Okay, so I'll go to my next slide and then you'll have the answer. And my computer is not letting me advance. So when we talk about wellness and health, the social determinants of health really make up 50 to 80% of your wellness. And when you look at the Canada's definition of determinants of health, 50% is your life, your income, your early childhood development, your education, your social safety net, your gender, et cetera, all these things that make up half of your wellness. And 25% really is due to your access to healthcare, your healthcare system, wait times, et cetera. And then your biology, your genetics, and then your environment as well. So it's not just us healthcare providers making a huge impact on people's lives. It's really the social context that they come from, some of, the time, some of their genetics, as well as the environment that they live in. And then the poll question number two already is what are the risk factors for social isolation? We know that social isolation is really detrimental to our wellness. So if you could have a look at these and choose your answer. And again, we'll close this one up pretty quickly. So maybe just another five seconds to get your answers in. And then you're seeing the results up there. Okay, I'm not seeing the results, but the answer is all of the above. And 100% and of people got that. Oh, good. <laughs> so we have a like-minded audience. And so we know that social isolation affects health. We've heard a lot about that lately, about how it's almost the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, et cetera. But as practitioners, we don't have people coming in and say, I'm socially isolated, help me. In fact, they're socially isolated. They probably won't even come to see you. So you have to look for ways of identifying risk factors for social isolation. And so we know from the literature that living alone is a risk factor. Major life transition, particularly if there was a death of a spouse, that's a huge red flag for me. If there's financial limitations, there's limitations in their travel, if they're living in a rural setting, if they have small social network, or if they're in a small minority group, LGBTQ groups, religious cultural groups, they're isolated. So those are the risk factors and that's where you need to pay attention to their social context and see if we need to intervene. 
And also health risk factors would be impaired mobility. And certainly in my population, the elderly, they start losing mobility as they become frail sometimes. And so we do consider that as a risk factor for isolation. If they lose their license, that's a huge risk factor as well. And then loss of um, health, a chronic disability, cognitive health, et cetera. These are things to watch out for because if you can identify the risk for social isolation, then you can do something about that. So social prescribing is a simple idea. This is a slide from University of Westminster in the UK. So this is where on the left side, we have a healthcare professional who identifies in their patient a social vulnerability, something that might affect their health. And then they may make a referral to a community link worker. And in the UK, that link worker actually belongs to their primary care network and is a member of that primary care team, which is great. But that link worker then makes contact with the patient and upon further identifying um, what barriers are for accessing services, et cetera, they'll make a referral to a range of voluntary and community and social groups. And so they have access to all these resources in the community that the practitioner may not know about. So that's basis of the social prescribing that we aim to replicate here in Fraser Health. So social prescribing is a non-clinical intervention to address those social elements. And it is an integration of both social and health models of care. And it has a particular focus on addressing the social determinants of health through interview and relationship building with the individual, and also ability to apply the equity lens. And it enables lifestyle changes that lead to healthy aging in choosing the right foods, food security, exercise activities, how to get to them if they don't know how to get where they are or how to get to them. It promotes mobility and social connections and addresses the social deprivation that we know <clears throat> can be detrimental to health. So that's social prescription. And in the UK, they said approximately 20% of visits to the family physicians were for social reasons, not medical reasons. And so it was prescribing and addressing those social needs, um, not necessarily the traditional medical prescriptions. So in Fraser, we've um, got these, <clears throat> this couple in the center and they see the healthcare practitioner on the left on the bottom. And they're referred to the community connector who then goes back and talks to the individual uh, and, or individual and caregiver, and then figures out what sorts of things will be helpful for them to be able to access the resources in the community. So they might need transportation, they might need help with their finances, they might need help with grocery delivery, um, et cetera. And then try and motivate the individual to make some goals that would lead to a healthier lifestyle and then accompany them if necessary to get to those resources in the community. And in the UK, this is some outcome that they shared, um, over 55s with frailty, 20, almost 25% reduction in the use of their emergency department, which is tremendous. And their carers, the caregivers living with the frail elderly, almost 20% reduction in the use of emergency services. So we know that social prescribing in, in the UK anyways, definitely led to reduction in the healthcare utilization, which is really great for the patients and their families, as well as for the healthcare system. So along with the social prescribing, which is the link worker in the community receiving these referrals <clears throat> and fairly um, <clears throat> heavy duty hands-on working with the individual and their family, we have also the signposting to increase the capacity of the social prescribing scheme. And the social prescribing, what we've developed in BC is partnering with BC211. And so they can actually go into BC211 or call 211 and say, this is what I need. And then that operator will be able to put them in touch with the resources. If they have the ability to navigate the site themselves, they can go on the website. So this is a social the, um, signposting that we talked about. And then if there's a higher need where a person really doesn't have the ability to navigate a website or they have nobody, or they can't really make the call and find the resource for themselves, they're referred to the social prescribing. And so the connector will actually make the call and guide them through the whole process and navigate the community for them. And so it's a, it's a hands-on process. It's through the community connectors. We're calling them community connectors in BC rather than the link worker, which is what they're called in the UK. They build a relationship with the individual over eight to 12 weeks and follow them sort of regularly. And then looking at their context, what are their social needs? 
and we recognize the social barriers to accessing community resources as being financial, cultural, physical, and psychological. So they may not have the means to pay for an exercise class, or they might have problems paying their rent and they're not able to pay for their food. All of these things will come out in their interview. And so that's addressing the social determinants of health and then helping them to get to those right resources. And so overcoming the barriers to wellness is what we're trying to achieve. And then if you look from the bottom, we're increasing the access to the community supports, improving the seniors and their confidence in using the community-based services, improving their quality of life, all the way up to older adults are able to remain more independent in their homes because of these supports. And the impact in the end is to reduce <clears throat> or delay healthcare utilization and in, enable seniors to be able to live independently in their homes longer. So to diabetes, so this is a fun slide I borrowed from my friend, Dr. Brendan Burns, who does lifestyle medicine. So diabetes is a story of too many calories in, and that leads to glucose um, or insulin resistance, and that leads to reduced muscle glucose uptake, which is, leads to increased uh, glucose in the environment. And also there's fat spillover with these excess calories coming in and energy coming in. And if the subcutaneous fat cannot store the energy anymore, then it's going to lead to increased liver fat. And so that liver fat causes decreased response to insulin. And that leads to increased blood glucose, which leads to increasing basal insulin, which is so detrimental to health. And that leads to excess amounts of fatty acids in the system in general, spilling over where they're supposed to be stored. And that leads to increased fat in the pancreas, affecting the pancreas ability to produce insulin. That leads to more secretion, decreased secretion of insulin, and then increasing blood glucose and on and on that cycle goes. So how do we stop this cycle? Lately, I've been really focusing on how do we keep our liver healthy? Because along with diabetes that we see a lot of, we have a lot of people with fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so with that extra fat, that sets, sets the liver up for that contribution to the type two diabetes that you just saw in the previous slide. So we want to get rid of that liver fat through wellness planning and healthy lifestyles, decrease the basal insulin requirements and normalize our fasting blood sugar. And so be kind to our liver. Be kind to your liver by stopping sugar, especially fructose, which is really harsh on the liver. Reduce alcohol. If you've got any issues with your liver, already have some fatty liver. Improve your gut health, increasing the fermented foods in our diet, decrease inflammation in our system all around. And that causes less glucose spillover from our muscle because of improved insulin sensitivity and decreased fat spillover from the fat cells. So avoiding type 2 diabetes and non-alcoholic steatohepatosis or liver uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we know any supportive measure to achieve sustained weight loss of 7 to 10% from baseline is helpful. The Mediterranean diet is recommended. And then, of course, exercise, 150 minutes per week of aerobic, preferably, but anaerobic as well. And then avoid alcohol if there's any amount of liver fibrosis, limiting alcohol even if there's no liver fibrosis and avoiding the industrial fructose and sugar or sweetened beverages. So this is all information that we know. And we also know that the muscle is our glucose sink. Normally 80 to 90% of our circulating sugar is stored in the muscles to be used when the muscles become active. And so active muscle is the way to metabolize our sugar. And that's so, so important. So that's why the recommendation, sit less than eight hours per day and get 150 minutes per week. But when you tell our patients this, knowledge is often not enough. And certainly the older adults, knowledge is not enough. When you just hand this out to them, often that's not enough for them to really participate and take, take that notice or make that happen. But maybe you can talk to them about joining a garden club in their community or starting a garden in their deck if they live in a condominium. So being active outdoors with other people, that is the key to our social prescribing wellness plan. And then also managing stress. We know that reducing stress reduces our cortisol, which is also helpful in managing our diabetes. So talk about architect your life, change your perception and mindset, reduce stress, 
enhance recovery ability, all these things that we can do to reduce stress. And again, social prescribing can help individuals to address things that are important in their lives, to give them an, a purpose and to improve the quality of their lives. And here is another poll question, number three, the last. So how can social prescribing help reverse type two diabetes? So we'll aim for 100% correct today too on this question as well. Yes, we will. And so I'll give five more seconds and I'll close it up. Okay. Yeah, so social prescribing can actually promote wellness by helping individuals to participate in exercise programming, promote wellness to reduce stress through socialization, healthy diet and food security, improving self-management and self-agency through wellness planning. So the answer was all of the above. And so go to the next slide. So in Fraser Health, we've been keeping track of social prescribing referrals coming from community practitioners, as well as uh, community home health practitioners and some hospital um, wards as well, where they've introduced social prescribing. And we see nutrition support and food access concerns being 60 um, referrals so far of 368. Assist with discharge from hospital even, we see that. Physical activity needs, um, seen quite a few referrals. IADL resource navigation, again, that's to look for um, things like transportation, how do they get help um, with help uh, with things outside of the community social engagement and leisure activities and caregiver support. Those are items that kind of <clears throat> made up all of the referrals to social prescribing and our community connectors were able to help the individuals to access those resources. So in Fraser Health, we've uh, introduced social prescribing in the primary care context in our PCNs, primary care networks, which are multidisciplinary primary care settings which is ideal for social prescribing. So we have often nurses, nurse practitioners, GPs, social workers, OTs, pharmacists, anybody who recognizes a social risk in their patients, they're able to make a referral to their community connector. And we have a community connector in each of the 10 communities throughout Fraser Health that correspond with the 10 divisions of family practice. So they identify a social vulnerability and they have a referral form on pathwaysbc.ca, which is a website that physicians use to, like, to find resources for specialist referrals, um, referral forms. And if you go into pathwaysbc.ca and search community like Chilliwack, it comes up with the local organization that provides the community connector as well as the referral form. And we also have a Fraser Health referral form on the Fraser Health Pulse page for those of you that are in Fraser. And we have a standardized referral form that can be completed and faxed to the communities according to where the patient lives. And so the, the completed referral form basically focuses on activities. So how to increase exercises for that individual, whatever is appropriate for them. And then food security, socialization, caregiver support. So these are four broad categories that you can tick off. And so the primary care network will make that referral and then further details come during the conversation with the connector and the patient. And then I always encourage all the members of the primary care network to get to know their community connector. There's only one in each community and, and you can get to know that person and be aware of what they're capable of doing. Some of them are really incredible. They will actually accompany people to exercise programs because the uh, older adult is shy and doesn't want to go by themselves, never been to the gym. So they'll go with them together for their get up and go classes or one case, a hula hoop dance class this individual wanted to go to. So the connector is really capable of a lot of things out there in the community. So this is a patient story. Um, it's not to do with diabetes per se, but James McDonald suffered from depression and anxiety. So he went to his uh, primary care provider who was a nurse practitioner in a clinic and he talked about his depression and but said didn't really want to take medication. So the NP referred him to a social worker in their primary care network. And the social worker referred him to the social prescribing program at Brella, which is a nonprofit organization in Surrey. And the community, community connector at, at Brella talked to him about what 
was causing his life difficulties, what kind of a social context he was from. And there was a need for lower um, rent housing. He was suffering financially, so she was able to find affordable housing for him. And then beyond that, she talked to him about his strengths and what sorts of things made him happy. And it used to be that he played the guitar, but he hadn't picked up a guitar for 20 years. And so they talked about how he might be able to use his strength to even help others. And so between the connector and James, they developed a program at Brella called Happy Hearts. And it was to use the art, arts like music, poetry, and, and visual arts to help people to come together and to focus on topics like gratitude. And so James was leading these groups weekly and he was seeing It's a Wonderful World with his guitar to start the program and they would all share in this time together. And because of his volunteerism and his reason for getting a lot, getting up in the morning that, that occurred because of this event and his ability to use his music again for himself as others, his depression and anxiety lifted and his depression was cleared without the need for medication. So he's now traveling around with his connector telling his story and about the benefits of social prescribing. And another story came to me from a medical student a group that I met um, last week. A 40 year old man, he was told that he had end stage, end stage diabetes. And I guess that might've been at a diabetes clinic. And he was told that he was gonna lose his sight he developed kidney failure and he might face amputation down the, down the road. Well, that was pretty devastating. And he spoke to his primary care provider and she said to him, yes, you have type two diabetes, but it can be reversed. It's reversible in many cases. Why don't we give it a try? So instead of prescribing medication right off, she sent him to or prescribed a cooking class in the community. So that was a social prescription. And so he went to his cooking class and after a while, he changed his diet, loved the cooking class, and then he started changing the way he eats and added some walking into his daily routine. And over time, he reversed his diabetes, and that was without medication, and he continues to walk. And I have a picture, lovely picture of the amputation because that's something that's very scary, and I tend to use that a lot with my patients. Anyway, so preventable and treatable. And then, of course, when we look at other disease of, diseases of the hormones, we treat them. So thyroid hormone excess is Graves' disease, and we treat that for sure. Cortisol excess is Cushing's disease, and we have to treat that. With insulin excess, which, which is hyperinsulinemia, we don't really have medical treatment. Nobody really treats that. Doctors don't really treat that. We don't even really know that it's happening. But when you've got somebody with that dietary excess of calories, inactivity, Liver, ha liver fatty ha um, fat happening, then we can treat that with social prescribing. And so whether it's a cooking class or, or changing their diet, it's encouraging exercise or supporting their exercise, uh, sending people that are socially vulnerable to social prescribing to actually help them to plan and make goals for themselves, that's the way that we can treat insulin excess, which is prior to development of diabetes even. So in the US, um, CDC shows that 11% of the citizens have type, type 2 diabetes in 2022. 29% of them were, 29% of people over the age of 65 have diabetes. So certainly a prevalent disease as people get older. And almost 50% of the US population either has or is pre-diabetic. That's a lot of people. So when you look at the numbers, when you think one in two people out there are at risk or is going to develop diabetes, it's not just a one person problem, it's not a one per practitioner problem, it can become a society problem. So we can all play a part and I think that's where social prescribing can help. So basically I think of it as waging war on type two diabetes. So it can be reversible. There are subtypes that can't be reversible but those are smaller numbers. And so majority of people can benefit from the lifestyle changes that we can implement. And everyone has a, a role to play. So that's your community, individuals, volunteers, et cetera. So not just the healthcare sector, it has to be everyone. And so through social prescribing, we can get everyone to sign up, uh, your neighbors, your family members, community organizations, health authority, government. We have to really look at this as a society uh, perspective. We can't be just leaving it up to the healthcare practitioner. So the social prescribing scheme is um, now taking hold in Canada. 
and the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing was uh, formed, I think, a couple of years ago under Red Cross. And this is their um, infographic on how to be well and aging healthy. So be more active, support your mental well-being, socially connected, live independently, support your finances. Sounds familiar. These are all the things that we need to do to prevent and manage type 2 diabetes as well. So social prescribing movement in Canada. So we started in Fraser Health and now it's spreading throughout the rest of BC. Alberta has it, Manitoba, Ontario has got several uh, pockets of social prescribing starting, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And then there's a global movement of social prescribing. It's a recognition that health does not belong to just the healthcare sector, that really only 20, 25% of health can be managed by the healthcare system. The rest of it has to be dealt with in the social sector. And that's what social prescribing is all about. So that's my presentation. These are some of the resources. If you're interested in look, looking um, a little bit further, socialprescribing.ca has a lot of information. And WHO has developed a toolkit on how to implement social prescribing. And that's actually a really great resource of everything that I've talked about and more about how you can implement it in your community. And social prescribing through CISP, they have a resource for health professionals as well. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or attend to the Slido. Awesome. I am just going to pull up the Slido. Um, we've had lots of questions that have come up um, while you were speaking, Grace, which is fantastic. So I just before we dive into this first question, um, what we're going to do is we do have, I think, seven or eight questions already that have come through. So if or 10, actually, if there's questions that you specifically want Grace to get to, knowing that we may run out of time, please make sure that you're using your thumbs up feature so that they come up to the top. So without further ado, here is our first question. Um, can you describe how social prescribing differs from simply sending a referral to a resource? I think the, the difference is the fact that the connector does that in-depth interview and developing a relationship and understanding the social determinants of health. That doesn't really happen when you just refer somebody to a diabetes clinic. I mean, they may do what they can, but they're not aware of all the resources in the community, the volunteers that are available to help that individual, you know, and also delving into their finances. That doesn't happen. And so if the finance is an issue, they can help through social prescribing. So I think the social determinants of health, the equity lens, those are differences uh, from simply referring to another resource. Hope that answers that question. So our next question here, have you found that the success from social prescribing includes communication back to the care team by the service themselves, or is it mostly patient reported? So we're working really hard. And so in Fraser, where we've been working diligently for the last couple of years on this, we will have a community of practice with all of our community connectors. And we've been working with them to try and develop a mechanism to send back a report back to the prescriber. And initially we were starting with um, primary care practitioners in different communities. Now we're working with community practitioners in Fraser Health as well. So we're trying to make a simple feedback kind of a template so they can write back at least what the resources were that the patient was connected to. And so that the re referring source uh, will get an idea that, okay, this was happening. But we are working to implement very soon some kind of an acknowledgement that your referral was, re re was received and that the connector was going to connect with the patient. So there's going to be a little bit more of... Um, um, information back to the referring source. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Sounds like still a work in progress, but lots of really fantastic work happening at Fraser Health, it sounds. Um, so this yeah. next question, mm -hmm. um, how do you hire and train the community connectors? I'm not clear if they are RNs or social workers or external to the primary care system. Right, so the primary care network is something that is in existence in BC and in Fraser, we've got, I think several um, primary care networks that have the teams in place already. So they have their nurses, their social workers, et cetera. 
the connectors are hired by the nonprofit organization in the community. So we're actually talking to somebody who is not in the health system. They actually have the experience of being in the community, knowing all of the resources in the community and being able to help the individuals to navigate to that side. So that's why the integration out into the community is what social prescribing you know, does. So how do we hire and train? So that gets done in the community by the nonprofit. They actually do a recruitment and the nonprofit organization will hire that person. They'll have a manager in place for that role. And then we have our community of practice with our, with our uh, community connectors in our region. And then we develop education programs depending on what sorts of um, education needs there are. And because we've been sending them quite a few referrals from the healthcare sector, so people in our community health, home health program, even our hospitals, they're actually starting to get referrals that they're not used to receiving, such as this person needs to get home from hospital and they need to have their you know, wheelchair picked up or they need to have bed rails put in, all these things that traditionally were all kind of done in the healthcare sector, but now we're sharing that. And if the community connectors are able to mobilize volunteers to do some of that um, for the family, they're able to get that done. So the hiring and the training sort of gets done in the community, but we're doing it in collaboration from the health sector and the nonprofit organizations. Thanks so much, Grace. It almost sounds like the community is wrapping around people to provide mm -hmm. them that's the, the support that they need. Um, this next question feels tied into it, but want to give mm -hmm. you a chance to um, respond to it as well. So what qualifies yeah. one to be a community connector? Does United Way supply their employees for this? These are great questions, you guys. Um, so community connectors come from a variety of backgrounds, and we have a job description that we've developed. Mostly the ability to understand the um, complexity of wellness and, and what it means for a person to have health and then how to co-design smart goals and, and do motivational interviewing. So that's all in the job description. Some people come with a background in healthcare. They may have um, been retired in nursing or social work and it's really great if we can get some of those people. Um, we have people that are just used to working in the nonprofit sector and just really aware of the needs of the community. So there's not one qualification, but a, a job description, um, just looking for people that are motivated to help those that are vulnerable. And does United Way supply their employees to do this? So United Way uh, flows funds from the Ministry of Health that funds the social prescribing scheme. So United Way sent out a, an expression of interest to all these um, community nonprofit organizations that have traditionally worked with United Way and a lot of them have things like better at home programs running through them as well. And so United Way flows the funds and, and we actually went out together with the division, the local of uh, the United Way and ourselves and the Fraser Health Social Prescribing Team to select together the nonprofit organization that will be awarded the grant. And then they went ahead and, and developed the program. Thanks for that, Grace. I'm wondering, you mentioned a job description in there. Is that something that's internal to um, Fraser Health or is that something available to um, folks online? I'll have to ask. We've developed it and we're just revising it because um, we've actually expanded the program in Fraser Health. And so we're actually putting in a little bit more um, health related um, requirements in our job description, but somewhere down the road, I'll be able to share it. Sounds good. Okay, so the next question here um, we have, how can you apply a decolonized lens to social prescribing? Any experience with this, suggestions, any barriers or successes? Yeah, a little bit of experience, not a whole lot. We've been working with our um, First Nations primary care clinics um, to see what social prescribing could look like there. And we know that we need to um, really start from what their needs are, understand what their goals are and look at um, people that are you know aware of the issues in um, in the Aboriginal community. And so working very slowly, we've learned you know layer by layer what sorts of things we need to think about when we bring a community connector program in. Um, but because it's still quite small, we've been able to connect um, those communities with, the larger communities and so the community connectors are aware of the referrals coming in but um 
so limited experience so far, I guess, is the, is the last thing I'd say about that, but working to try and understand better how we can do that. Thanks, Grace. And so this next question, how do you get connected to a community connector? What if you don't have a primary care provider? So I guess this is from the patient perspective. Mm -hmm. Good question. So having a primary care provider is so, so important. It actually is a one of the social determinants of health. But we have been going to the UPCCs where in Fraser, the urgent care um, clinics are receiving um, patients that are un unattached. And so they're they're, the practitioners are also aware about social prescribing. So if an unattached patient comes to a UPCC, they can be referred to social prescribing as well. So we're working to try and provide all kinds of services to unattached patients, not just for social prescribing, for, but for other things as well. So otherwise, if you have a family doctor, of course, through family doctor, but you can actually refer yourself. You can um, go look up... Um, I guess pathways, yeah, pathways.bc, pathways.bc.ca has an out, a community facing page as well that you can go in and um, look up social prescribing and that will show you which um, organization in the community to connect with. Thanks so much for flagging that resource, Grace. I've, I'm gonna add that into the post webinar email as well. So when you get mm -hmm. the information about the recording and, and other pieces of that, we'll make sure to include that link so that everybody can get access if they haven't used it before. And I see mm -hmm. Jamie's just put it in the chat now. So this next question, um, who is following up with lifestyle change over time? How do they get referred to a lifestyle practitioner? So that's an interesting question. Traditionally, it's been your primary care provider that follows you over time. Your family doctor really has the mandate to follow, you know, from cradle to grave and has that opportunity because of that longitudinal relationship. But if you don't have one and maybe you're younger and you don't really feel you need one, you can look up sort of private practitioners and there is um, one, there's a so wellness garage is what it was called in South Surrey. And then I see in LinkedIn um, advertising for lifestyle medicine. So basically, if you can find those private practitioners, then you can do that. Um, I think just speaking to your pharmacist is really a great resource as well, as well as if you have access to a dietitian, nutritionist, talk about what might, might be um, healthy for your lifestyle over time. Um, yeah, but I think if you have um, if you have prediabetes or if you have NASH already, it would be really great for you to get to a medical practitioner and start thinking about how can you make differences to your health and lifestyle and social prescribing will be part of that. So this next question, are there plans to expand the program to allow people um, under 65 years old? So SIFS, the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, looks at social prescribing for all ages. And there are pockets of work being done for people under uh, age of 65. It's just that we were funded from the government through the healthy aging sector through United Way. And that's why we were looking at the older, older population. And because I work in the community health services for seniors and complex and frail needs, that's why we've worked together with the older population. But definitely if there is a need then um, we should be looking to these organizations um, for the resources. And so if you're age 55 and you have a social need, then you can connect yourself to the nonprofit organizations or ask your family doctor to refer you. So we're not really fixed on the age of 65. We're mostly going with the needs of the individual. And then over time, we will be seeing um, people that are younger. Um, you know, we have social prescribing for adolescents. We have social prescribing happening at the maternity clinic in my community. They want to look at socially high risk moms as they're pregnant and then offer them, you know, nutrition services and parenting advice and follow through that kind of thing. And that's all social prescribing as well. Thanks so much. And so the next question, do you have any plans to evaluate the program to see if it's effective, cost effect, cost saving and making an impact? Yes, definitely we're evaluating. 
And so we're evaluating from Fraser Health side, and then there's also evaluation going on from the United Way side, and there's also research evaluation going on, really looking at, you know, what is the uptake, what is the reach, and then also what is the impact, and looking at healthcare utilization in the end. So that's a big study that's being done by a health economist at UBC. So there, there's ongoing evaluation, and we're looking at a patient, um, um, patient, um, what is that called? Real-time patient experience survey. We're using that now to get patient-centered um, evaluation as well. And then this next question, I guess it's a terminology question, but I think an important one. Um, I'm wondering about the use of reversing diabetes. Is it not better to say remission to prepare people that the change may not be permanent? Any experience point, with that? Point well taken. Absolutely. Yep. And you got to you understand I'm immersed in the world of social prescribing more so than just diabetes. And so, yes, I take that very, yeah, remission for sure. Thank you. And then this next one, how has social prescribing been to other minority ethnicities, particularly among immigrant populations who may have lower health care utilization? Yes, so we work with an organization in Burnaby called Mosaic, and that is a particularly multicultural uh, organization. A lot of their programming dedicated to new Canadians. And so we will be learning more, um, evaluating some of their um, outcomes as well. Um, but working closely with that organization is helping us to really tailor our services. And then also because it's a multicultural nonprofit organization, their resources are multilingual. They have multicultural um, cooking classes, multicultural interpreters to, to help them to get to resources, helping them to navigate some of the, you know, the Canadian policies and politics and everything else is so difficult for new immigrants. So all of that is happening in the community level, which is fantastic to see. And for a person that's worked in healthcare for, you know, 35, 40 years, whatever I've been doing, it's really amazing to see what's possible out in the community for people that are otherwise so underserved and really unaware of what's out there for them. And these are patients that I've seen, you know, coming over from Korea, not, not speaking the language, and I'm trying to help them navigate and really not knowing, you know, what they can access. But having these community organizations dedicated to helping new settlers, new Canadians, has been really eye-opening for me. And then this next one's a pretty specific question, um, and I'm not sure if you know the answer, Grace. How many community connectors does Fraser Health have, and what does that kind of break down to about how many per elderly population? Okay, so I haven't done the math, but we have 10 community connectors so far that have been funded through United Way, and we're about to expand that to 22. We will end up having 22, and per elderly population, I think we've got about 20% of our population is over the age of 65. We've got almost 2 million people. And I don't really want to do the math, but approximately you get this, you get the gist. So we still need more. Um, so the, I think the idea of social prescribing is really taking hold in Fraser. And so there's been investment from Fraser's side to expand the program and to augment what's been funded through United Way. And United Way has also been, um, um, supported by the ministry with additional funding to spread to the rest of the province. So it's an idea that's really taking hold. And um, so recognizing vulnerable populations, uh, especially the elderly, because we know that there's such a reliance on healthcare services for the elderly and, you know, really promoting their quality of life by connecting them to the community, getting them out socializing, connecting them to garden clubs, which is really, really health promoting. Yeah, I like the next question. Yes, it's expanding to Vancouver Coastal. And there is a group of people that are very interested and United Way is speaking to them. So it'll take a little while for them to kind of work through all the logistics. But there's, I think, a couple nonprofit organizations already that applied for the first round of funding from United Way. That's one in Collingwood and one Frog Hollow, I think, is the other one. But there's going to be more in Vancouver Coastal. And I'll just flag one question that came through the chat. I don't know if you have anything else to add, 
but just wondering about Richmond and if there's anything um, that you know of happening in Richmond relating to social prescribing. Yeah, Richmond does have social prescribing. And I don't remember the organization, but I think you can Google social prescribing in Richmond. Um, yeah, Richmond is actually very rich in its resource network, especially for older adults. So I think you'll find that for sure. There is one in Richmond that was funded from United Way also. And I'll just flag as well for the comments here in the chat that Jamie also mentioned that if you can't find anything on Pathways for your community, 211 is another resource yes. that, um, that can help you with that. Um, and so this next question, what is one thing a clinician can do to start the journey to applying social prescribing principles to their clinic? Well, you can do what I started doing. I, I started thinking, there's got to be other people that can help me with this because I really don't know how to find lower rent housing for this person. And so I started looking at the local paper and then there's, you know, um, just little ads about community events, community organizations. So start opening yourself up to what's available in your community. And then I even went to one organization that I knew was a community that was a senior serving organization that was called Brella that I spoke about earlier. And I just walked through and checked out what they did. And there's all these seniors learning how to use their cell phones and their iPads and telephones. So I think you just have to um, open yourself up to the concept, understand what there is in your community and then start applying it. And so that's if you make the referral, you can even make the referral, you know, to the food bank, just write a prescription to the food bank and then find out where the, you know, how they get there. Or you can refer them to a local organization and they'll find out how to get them to the food bank. So there's a huge network of volunteers out there already. And until the social pre prescribing scheme with the community connector comes into place, you can start using social prescriptions already in your practice. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thanks for speaking to, to how this all started for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've spoken to this a few times, mm -hmm. but I'll yeah. put it to you in case there's anything else you'd like to add. Where does the funding come from for the community connectors and the organization that's, that employs them? Yeah, so that's basically from the Ministry of Health. And they run a stream to United Way to address the uh, the healthy aging journey. And so United Way has different departments and healthy aging department is the one that received this funding for um, community connectors um, to help the seniors in the community. Perfect. And then I'll just flag, we are coming towards the end of the webinar. We still have yeah. two questions on here. We maybe have time for one or two more. So if there is anything else, anybody else is wondering, now's your sort of final chance. And then we'll, we'll go into these last few questions. So social prescribing, similar to social work, what are the similarities yeah. and differences so in your it opinion? Is, it is very similar to social work. And I had a practice leader in Fraser Health work with us when we developed our program. But it's different from social work in that the community um, connectors are not licensed social workers. They don't do work with, you know, the, um, <clears throat> the really difficult cases, the highly ethical cases, um, the ones with the um, adult guardianship issues, all of that falls under traditional professional, the social work professionals, but the community connectors address all those social needs and the social determinants and they access the community resources. So there's a bit of difference from what our professional social workers do. Then I'll just pop to the last question because we're running out of time. So how safe are your health records and ownership when referred to the program? So that's really important question. So we developed a, um, information sharing agreement with United Way and the local um, nonprofit organizations. We don't share health records. We only share information that would allow the connector to do a good job, which is maybe the admitting diagnosis at a recent hospitalization. Maybe if you have let them know that the person has had a stroke and has hemiplegia, you know, little bits of information that you think would help the connector to provide the right kind of service and explore the right kind of resources for your patients, but they do not have access to your health records. Thank you for that question. Thank you for all your questions. That's fantastic. Yeah, there was such a diversity of questions that came through in the, the Slido, and I think Grace, I don't know the exact number, but I think you answered over 20 questions. So thank you yeah. for, for being game for that and just um, providing such context to the presentation you already gave. 
I'm going to transition us now just to sort of wrap up today's webinar. So if you're still feeling like you want more social prescribing this week, here's a couple of events that are coming up and I'll just put some links in the chat for you in case you'd like to learn more about these. So um, there's a co-production and social prescribing better together um, workshop which is gonna be in Vancouver um, on Thursday. So I'll put the link for that in the chat now. And then there's also- It's actually, Kate, oh. it's actually Burnaby. Oh, it's, it's, on, Burnaby. it's on Boundary Road at the Mosaic. Okay, sorry about that. It is in Burnaby. Um, and so the link will um, be in the chat here in just a moment. And then the second one here is from the Canadian Social Prescribing Student Collaborative. Um, if there are students in your life or if you're a student and you wanna learn more about social prescribing, and um, there's an evening event tomorrow night in Vancouver. And um, when I looked online, the restaurant wasn't determined yet, but it's expected to be in Vancouver. Um, a few resources that came up in the presentation today and that Grace had mentioned earlier on, um, along with some links, these will go out in the post webinar email. Um, and less time sensitive, so I won't put them in the chat now just to help save your browsers, but there's the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing website, the toolkit on how to implement social prescribing, the Center for Effective Practice, Social Prescribing a Resource, and then Pathways, which we spoke about in some detail. So just wanted to send a big thank you to everyone. Um, there is an evaluation survey that should pop up in your browser after you exit this webinar. We'll also put that in the email for you. Um, our next Type 2 Diabetes Network event is a presentation in November on deprescribing medications and diet changes in Type 2 diabetes. So we're really excited to bring everyone back together for that. And then just a reminder that the webinar recording presentation slides um, will be posted to our website soon. So once again, um, Dr. Grace Park, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we really, really appreciate it and um, appreciate everyone for being here and asking such fantastic questions. With that, I think we're ready to end. Thanks, everyone.